David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrich, and hello, everyone. Um, my name's Ian Boyd, and I am talking to you from the Isle of Wight, uh, just off the south coast of England. Um, we're a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve, and so that status with UNESCO and with UN has been quite influential in the way we've thought about greening um, in a very sort of general way, I suppose, improving ecological health and well-being, really, both for people and wildlife in the same place at the same time. Um, and to, to help us um, with our decision making and the projects that we're working on, and they may be related to planning and development, or they may be related to the design of a project with a community or a municipal authority, we, we created, through trial and error, a set of nine um, prompts, queries, that we've called Shaping Better Places. And I'm going to talk about the first three in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but I wanted to show you all nine. And the reason for that is that, as I think you've talked about in, in the excellent presentations you've had today, the recombination, the reintegration of biodiversity with human ecology, um, both our social networks for real in physical places and the cultural identity, the distinctiveness of the places that we live. Um, pulling them back together again, removing them from their silos is absolutely essential if we're going to make any kind of meaningful progress and release agency in the communities that need that most of all so that they are not disenfranchised from the decision-making processes, which is, of course, crippling and one of the big problems with the democratic process we have. So we have these nine prompts, and I'm, I'm happy to share those through Ulrich for anyone who would like to, to take a closer look. But I'm just going to talk about the, the first three. But I guess the first thing I wanted to say is that really what we might call um, ecological solidarity uh, which is an easy thing to say and a hard thing to define, is, is, is a really good place to start. It, thinking about places as habitats for humans is, is essential. And a lot of this stuff is very old, just as we've known about climate change for a very long time and done precisely nothing about it. We've known these things about what makes places livable, what makes places healthy for 50, 60 years. We've seen it implemented in the kind of ecological humanism movement to architects such as Richard Neutra and others and we've kind of forgotten I think almost all of it to be honest and this is a great example it from Forrest Stern um, who was an American ecologist and urbanist and it just perfectly captures the point really that we have to think about places as habitats for people and heterogeneity more than anything we have become incredibly good at creating very bland simplified, homogeneous public spaces that are really designed to be able to be maintained simply, but their utility and value have been considered secondary or even actually quite annoying. The perfect design is often the one that has no people in it at all to trouble it. And I, so I, I think this is a great uh, reminder that we can divide open spaces into rooms. We can make them small and impactful rather than large and bland. And in doing so, we increase opportunity, we increase affordancy for every cohort. And in fact, for the different kinds of communities that come to a place. And I think that's super important. I know, I know it's come up in the things you've talked about, but in doing this, we create opportunities to, if you like, design new celebrations, new um, new points of interest, almost new sacred spaces in our public realm that are new, that are common to all of the ethnic groups and communities that are currently in a place. It allows that kind of design of shared spaces rather than defaulting to whatever has been prescribed for a place. It's a garden, it's a park, it needs to be maintained in this way. You must walk here, but don't walk there. You can sit there, but definitely don't sit over there and so on. And so I think we need to be much more imaginative about the way we define these places. And really from a wildlife point of view, we've ended up, I think, thinking of urban space as looking like this. These are cartoon book illustrations, actually, um, as being terrifyingly hostile and inhabited only by shadowy monsters. 
And of course, that's just not the case. The truth is that cities are full of nature. I mean, even if you don't want them to be, and quite often modern design doesn't want it to be. Modern design likes buildings that are hyper hygienic, scrub clean, glass and plastic surfaces on which we don't want a speck of living things. But of course they are there, they're there all the time. And so cities are full of life, cities are full of nature, but it's opportunistic and perhaps it's temporary, but nonetheless it is there and increasingly so. And so I think the value of cities and urban spaces for wildlife needs to be recognised in the first instance. It's not a case at all of us deigning to allow nature into a city. We are already occupying functioning ecosystems. We probably damage them very badly in building urban places the way that we do. But nature and the natural systems and the ecological processes are there already. And so nature inevitably inhabits a city. It's just that we don't do it in a meaningful and thoughtful way. And in fact, we then do everything we can to hold it at bay. And then perhaps we'll, we'll initiate a project to let nature in through this door, into this park, and celebrate that. But in actual fact, nature is constantly moving through a cityscape, an urban landscape of any sort. The top 200 metres of any city, which of course we've kind of fully occupied with tall buildings now, in that 200 metres are the daily commuting movements of millions, billions of living organisms, not just seeds, not just winged insects, but spiders ballooning on silk, bats, foraging flights, the movement of mammals and reptiles and birds, um, quite aside from high-level migration that moves on above that, that 200 metres and perhaps another metre below ground is full, constantly full of life. But we have not designed it into the way we look at places. Now, there's lots of really fascinating studies that tell us this story, that urban places are rich in biodiversity, whether we like it or not. That doesn't mean to say that they are they replace successfully the areas that they were built upon because they don't urban places are necessarily damaging to semi-natural spaces but they bring with them a different kind of novel ecology a different kind of contrived ecology which has advantages and so there, some of the studies i've just put a couple of images up the one on the left is from um published in 2021 some really interesting work on uh public parks in berlin um monitoring invertebrate populations, particularly bees, a solitary bee species and hoverflies, showing that a large proportion of the total inventory of species known from, the, from, from Germany, in fact, are present in the city. It's quite remarkable. And even more astonishing is the very famous work by Jennifer Owen on her Leicester, Garden Leicester's a, a, a big city in uh, the North Midlands, 50-year um, study of species that Jennifer Owen found in her garden. And it's absolutely astonishing to see that among small stuff, mainly, it's true, it's not full of links, but it's full of hoverflies and, and uh, a vast array of small invertebrates and other small wildlife, to the extent that 60, 70% of the full taxonomic list of some of these species, some of these groups, were represented in her garden. So it's quite astonishing how rich urban environments already are for wildlife and how much more so they could be if we actually chose an intentional approach to the way we design these places, a, a deliberative and determined and enthusiastic approach to making urban spaces colonisable, uh, biologically receptive, rather than feeling we have to constantly bleach and scrape every surface clean to keep ourselves healthy of course it does entirely the opposite it makes us ill um so just an example again taken from a very fascinating paper 2021 that i've referenced at the bottom there five pathways by which cities can actually plug into well they are already plugged into regional eco ecosystems but ways in which they can be beneficial one is releasing species from threats in the larger landscape and this is especially um, in the case of industrial agricultural landscapes, which are hostile to wildlife. They are simplified ecologically. They tend to be monotypic, both in terms of their topography and uh, their content. And of course, with herbicides and fungicides and pesticides and with other forms of control, wildlife is pushed to the margins and seeks out 
cities and urban spaces as refuge. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is optimised for these species, but it can be their last chance is to retreat to urban spaces. The second thing is that it, it, it increases heterogeneity, and we've just talked about that, the, the vast diversity of surface, of aspect, of temperature, um, of geology, of plant makeup, both uh, exotic and native, the kind of uh, instantaneous and opportunistic urban flora on the one hand and the designed landscapes of parks and urban gardens on the other. Vastly diverse and heterogeneous in a way that agricultural landscapes are, are not at all. And with that genetic diversity, and this is very interesting, the fact that cities and urban spaces impose a consistent adaptive pressure on the species that inhabit them. And that in some ways this may pre-adapt, in actual fact, uh, taxonomic groups to climate change. If they move into cities and the phenotypic diversity finds niches because it's so diverse within which they can flourish, this in effect may be building up genetic diversity necessary to then spill back out into the changed landscapes around cities under the processes of climate change. Migratory stopovers, again, because of forage value, because of the height of the buildings, because of the refuge from predation that these may provide, cities can be incredibly valuable migratory stopovers. The pre-adaption to climate change, I've already mentioned, along with genetic diversity. And crucially, and I think in tune with what so many of your speakers have said, uh, increasing the opportunities for wildlife encounter maximising the scope for some kind of experience of the natural world in your daily round. Going to nature reserves is fantastic. Taking, making the effort to perhaps drive to a wonderful place for bird watching is brilliant and we want, to, we want to encourage as much of that as possible. But encountering wildlife by stepping out of your front door and going about your day is essential. It is invaluable. We have 30 years of research that tells us that this is vital to human health and well-being because we are biological entities. We are part of an ecological system. It's no good pretending that we are cyborgs because we're not. We're entirely biological, most of us, and that is vital. That is the way that we must think about the way that we manage the spaces around us. And an encounter with daily wildlife is, of course, good. So what do we need to do? We need to move from these opportunistic approaches to design in the urban realm for wildlife to a, dire a directed <laughs> biological utilization. That means making spaces that are designed to attract, support and keep biodiversity. And we can do that in all sorts of ways and I'll show you some in just a sec. The other one is, the next one is from incidental to intentional. So a similar idea this idea of intentional habitat design. We should be, we should be making buildings more interesting for a start. Uh, the idea of ornament, of decoration has vanished from the urban scene. They are bland and they are, I think, damaging to human psychology. So what if we can intentionally improve the aesthetics by allowing species to colonise the built environment, the urban realm, but to do it deliberately, to do it intentionally? And I think... Go, moving away from a lot of the baggy terminology, I honestly believe that so much of what we are trying to achieve requires a change in our language. We use terms like sustainability, biodiversity, resilience, really as, as if they can mean anything at all now. They've lost all their precision and they can mean whatever you want and they can mean whatever I want. They've become very baggy terms. And so we need new words. We need new metaphors. Um, in order to be able to establish different ways of thinking and different ways of thinking lead to different ways of acting. And I would, for example, suggest this idea of probiotics. Now that's a dietary term. I think generally you buy something to make you better because it improves your gut biome and that's probiotics. But probiotic is a brilliant word and we'll have it back, I think. Thank you very much. Simply meaning that a place that is suitable for life, that is encouraging of living things. We need to design and focus on the design of probiotic cities. And that might, for example, mean prebiotic planning, so that the planning process, the design process, is anticipating a <laughs> biologically activated urban realm. Not just bringing it in here and there, not just um, uh, coping with it in the places that we can't fully cleanse, 
but very deliberately drawing wildlife into urban spaces. So the three techniques I wanted to talk about, the first three of the nine on that first slide of Shaping Better Places, is um, first of all to revive the built environment through, through what we would call life cycle resources. So that is providing everything that the living world needs in packages dotted through the city. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail in a sec. The second one is not just to work on ground floor. We're obsessed with flat green spaces. Why is everything flat? Because it's easy to maintain. Things should be lumpy, topographically interesting. But we also build enormous structures with surfaces and roofs and platforms and ledges in our built environment. We need to look at all of that all the way up to the top. And we also need to think about subterranean places. We need to think about underground car parks. We need to think about these other realms that can also be biologically activated. And we need to space these interventions. One of the problems we have is that it can seem absolutely overwhelming to make a positive intervention in a big place like a city, or even a big place like a single park. And so we retreat to writing reports and considering options and so on, and never really take action. And I think the secret is to condense our interventions into very small spaces and then to replicate. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So life cycle resource, that is food, so that is pollen and nectar, seed, fruit, it's edible foliage, it's edible roots, it's edible fungal networks in the soil. Everything needs to be edible. So if you're going to do a planting scheme, planting stuff that is not edible by anything is meaningless. Um, so we need to move away from just a kind of standard landscaping response to urban places that is evergreen and all the same level and highly inedible to a mixed, interesting, diverse sward that has uh, a, sh a layer for, for, for herbs, a layer for shrubs, a layer for canopy, often in the same place at the same time. High edibility, we need food everywhere. And we can do that for people too. Fantastic that we can actually mix the idea of orchards for people and all eat for wildlife, for example. We need to allow spontaneous vegetation to flourish. The moss on a roof is not going to knock your, your house down. It might be something you need to bear in mind. It might be something that you need to control to some extent. But we can design places where allowing natural colonization to happen, through, particularly through these simple plants, mosses, lichens, liverworts, these are the terraformers. These get things started. They provide the first habitat for this movement of wildlife to take root. We deliberately and intentionally create places where it can flourish. We don't rush out and maintain it out of existence. We need to keep water in the urban environment. So bottom left are actually artificial rock pools that are designed and made by our team here, by my friend and colleague Nigel George, who spent a decade designing artificial uh, intertidal habitats that can be incorporated into, and of course the urban coast is as much a city uh, feature as its terrestrial habitats. So urban coasts and artificial habitats is actually a very well advanced industry. And the work that we do here is very much a part of that. We're much less imaginative in the rest of the city. But we can do this. We can create small ephemeral wetlands. We can use constructed wetlands for flood management as very active habitats if we choose to, rather than siloing you know, flood defence engineering from conservation engineering. We put them together in the same place at the same time. We need to create nesting, roosting habitats. So much of the city uh, could be used by species that are now wholly dependent on the built environment. The swift, which is the top right-hand photograph, is a bird that certainly in the UK almost only nests in buildings. It is almost completely dependent on the human built environment. There may be a handful of cliff nesting swifts left in Scotland, but not elsewhere. But we make places that are hostile to nesting wildlife. We don't want birds sharing our buildings. We don't, certainly don't want bats sharing our buildings. They have this mythic quality that still seems to terrify people. Um, but we mustn't do that. We must rethink and intentionally design 
the built environment to accommodate nesting and roosting, not just birds, and bats, but also invertebrates. The bottom right hand uh, photograph you can see uh, Rufus Mason bee. So we can very, very easily, for small invertebrates, we can do this very quickly, very simply. We can create inhabitable features in the built environment that are almost immediately used because species are moving through all the time. We can create places where they're going to sit, where they're going to stand. And even in, in the kind of planting that we, that we design, that we choose, we can create structural materials that offer the same kind of features. We've got hibernating ladybirds there in a hollow stem. It'll be an umbrella for, of some kind. So we, we need to think about the whole range of life cycle resources that species need. And we need to provide them in dense packages in the places where we can intervene. In the new built environments, in retrofit to existing built environments, in the landscape design that we come up with for our parks and our gardens uh, and our highways networks too, life cycle resource is absolutely critical. So we also need to stop just working at ground level. So we tend to think of interventions for wildlife generally being that landscape in the park or this area at ground level that I can walk through. And of course, that's absolutely necessary. But we need to think about every level, every surface, all the way up and all the way down. Now, to some extent, we're doing that with green roofs and green walls. They are commonplace now. They're not exceptional. They're not unusual. We see green roofs and green walls in, in every city on the planet. But very often, they are not designed as habitat. They're designed as spectacles. They're designed uh, to get through the planning process, and then they're forgotten entirely. They have no utility at all after them. But there's no reason at all why we can't have beautiful and uh, uh, even sort of corporate window dressing can be highly ecologically functional if we choose the correct palette of substrates, the correct palette of plants for our green roofs, our green walls. And in that way, we begin to create platforms, ground level landscapes in our parks, providing food, high level green roof habitats, providing nesting sites for 20 species of solitary bees. And the bees are feeding between the two. The bees are moving from, let's say, the green roof down into the public park, highly edible. And at, at that level, I'm encountering them. I'm seeing this wealth of biodiversity because we're beginning to build an ecosystem of life cycle resource by using every available surface. And I think we need to go underground as well. We need to think about underground spaces. And that may mean excavating more ponds. It may mean simply excavating more dips and hollows, creating an undulating surface rather than a flat. We need to think about soil structure, particularly the, the, the fungal um, uh, taxonomic groups and how crucial they are to a healthy functioning ecosystem. So we need to think about every surface. The whole of the urban volume, the whole of the urban surface area is there for us to intervene in, is there for us to uh, make some intentional intervention. For so We've made things edible. We've begun to construct dense packages of life cycle resource, and we've done so from below ground to ground level and all the way up to the top of our city environment. Now, the next thing we need to do is to, is to replicate. Now, it's quite easy to, and it's affordable to condense one of these interventions into a very small space. You might only have a window box to play with. You might only have a street planter to play with, but you can still treat it in this way. Life cycle resource, densely concentrated. Every feature, every structure, fully optimized for wildlife. Let's imagine it's a wooden planter full of plants. The plants are all edible, and the planter itself is habitat because we've drilled holes for the species that are feeding on the flowers to nest in, for the caterpillars of the species leading, li living on the le leaves to pupating. So we can do this in a box. We can certainly do it in a park. And then we make a meaningful jump and we do it again. So rather than scale, and scale is death, we are obsessed with the idea that ideas are only valuable if you can scale. And what does that mean? It means blowing them up to a point of conceptual abstraction such that it can fit anywhere in the world, at which point it's lost all of its local distinction. It's lost all of its local impact. And it's become simply material to put into reports, as I think others have said earlier in the day. So we need to stop 
uh, conceptualizing highly effective practical interventions and simply replicate. So let's move 100 meters. Let's say we've done a really interesting bit of work in a corner of a park, not the whole park, just a corner. And we draw a 100 meter radius around. And we look to see where within that circle might be a logical next step. Is there another park? Is there a school? Is there a church? Is there an abandoned bit of brownfield? Is there an urban corner that no one seems to know what to do with? And we can do it again. Now, choosing that metric is really important and very interesting. So the dispersal distances of small wildlife in particular is often around that sort of metric of out of the meat or less. But it's also, and we know this from the work of amazing architects such as Jan Gell, it's also within the kind of metric of human disputes, around the sort of distances that we feel comfortable walking within a city environment. We may walk 500 metres in an area, a, 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 a locality we're unfamiliar with before turning back and coming back to where we started. This idea of ex, an exploratory distance. We may feel that we're safe within 100 metres of our children playing in a park, for example. So these are not wildly different metrics. The metrics of wildlife dispersal and territory is very similar to the metric of human social behaviour, the movement of humans in the habitats that we create for ourselves. So if we map over them, one over the other, this intervention for wildlife here becomes a signpost to the next one 100 metres away, which I am happy to walk to. And there's a bench there. There's information embedded in that bench that tells me about this network of interesting spaces. Orientation within the city is wildlife and biodiversity as part of its machine, but at the same time it's providing habitat for those species. So we need to scale by replication, not by abstract. It's absolutely critical to the way. So just last... Uh, slide. Um, this is from a project here in the UK called Rewilding My Street, uh, which you can find on the website of the same name. And it's just a, a really interesting example where they've taken up a, a normal kind of residential, um, perhaps a, a suburban environment, and they've, they've identified where a whole range of invertebrates, mammals, and birds, amphibians and reptiles might be found. And so you can imagine a neighbourhood scale approach to optimising, intentionally designing a space for wildlife that has a tremendous rich quality in terms of the diversity of taxonomic groups, in terms of the ability, uh, their accessibility to us. We see these things, we encounter them in our, if not our day, then in our week or our month or our year, we'll encounter these things. And we could shrink all of this to a single property and a single garden. The same rules apply, and we can repeat somewhere else. So these ideas of small scale, highly concentrated interventions for wildlife, replicated up and down through the urban realm at meaningful distances for people and for wildlife, within a philosophy of urbanism in the city that actually encourages and welcomes colonisation by wildlife, that does not push it away, that does not scrub it out of existence, that does not just hands off allow it to be anywhere perhaps, but defines spaces where that natural process can take place, where we can allow a natural succession of habitats to bring with it biodiversity that then links to the designed habitats alongside. This mix of natural and semi-natural with designed and contrived ecology is one of the things that makes city environments so rich, so heterogeneous, and that's to be celebrated. So we can absolutely, using the design skills we have and the ecological knowledge that we have, bring nature back to the city, except it's already there. We need to recognise it's there. We need to encourage it more. And we need to uh, fully optimise the city environment for the maximum range of taxonomic groups that we possibly can, for all of the reasons that I've talked about in these short presentations. So it's entirely possible. We just need to rethink slightly different language and begin to take this different approach. Amazing. Well,
Yeah, Thank things, you. Huh? And we have a question. Wildlife includes way much more than birds, bugs, and uh, so many other things. They would uh, include uh, quite a number of larger wildlife too. Where do you, where do you uh, cut the limit? I, I don't think you do. And I think it's already happening. You know, big cats in South American cities, uh, deer in, in British cities, it's, it's already happening. So um, one of the most fruitful areas is what we might call the peri-urban environment, that space that's on the edge of cities that isn't quite agricultural and it's not quite urban. It may have been sterilised by planning applications that have never been built, for example, which is actually right. a really interesting area. And this is a kind of green belt, but not just a pointless uh, um, planning constraint, but actually a fully activated environment that allows that interface specifically for larger animals. But I mean, in the heart of a city, in, in any um, uh, uh, English city, certainly, there will be medium-sized wildlife anyway. There'll be badgers, there'll be foxes, and they will be operating differently. Much, they're a different social structure, much denser, their territorial spaces are much smaller because forage value is much higher in the city. Lifespans may be shorter because of all of the threats, but this is not really a, a weakness, it's simply an adaptation. So I think to answer your question, big wildlife is moving in, whether we like it or not. And it's as well, again, that we intentionally think about designing spaces to accommodate, to allow that to happen. Right. I, I, I certainly don't uh, disagree with you that wildlife uh, is a and nature is more than just green things, but would you imagine something which sometimes we call elephant in the China store? Can you imagine something, the elephant going down in uh, New York City and, you know, design the city to that? Or, or I am, I'm, I'm pushing this, no question. So yeah. I, I'm trying to see where and how we can set limits. And then I will get back to certain things uh, later on, but this is just one thing which I, you know, interests my fancy. Yeah, I, I, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Again, I think, and I think it was a point Ulrich made earlier, I think one of the issues we perhaps have, and I guess it's just the way that we, the way that we have become used to planning projects, is that we need to set definite limits at the start of a project. We need to set and fully prescribe a project for the next five years as if we know what's going to happen. And I think that's extremely dangerous. So I think one of the things we need to do, of course, there needs to be risk analysis. There needs to be the kind of dynamic risk analysis you would expect. We're a sophisticated species. We can probably do this successfully without necessarily stating now that the limit I'm going to impose looks precisely like this and then sticking to it regardless of what nature says. So I, I take your point and of course there, there are risks to people from, from a reckless approach to this and, I, and I'm not suggesting that. I'm, but I'm suggesting that we can allow this process to develop, to monitor it, to encourage it, to test it out with the participation of, of the people who live and work in these places, and we can design solutions around the, 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 uh, the effects that we don't want to happen that are clearly damaging both to us and to wildlife, putting both at risk in the course of the project evolving. So I'm just suggesting that it can be done. We, we may just not, not know the answers yet. I fully agree. And one thing with modern cities have all the glass surfaces of the curtain wall and birds are dying there by the hundreds. And then you can see your, uh, you know, because this was the modern architecture and the openness and then the birds are, well, dying. Now we are recognizing this issue and then perhaps, uh, maybe not too late, but we have all glass boxes. Yeah, but it's in, uh, what you addressed, what you both addressed, it's an additional point of general of general interest referring, I just want to make it a connection for the bit. Uh, in a different presentation of the entire day and the topics. Uh, it's a point about uh, this culture nature divide, so characteristic of our Occidental realm. How much nature we want to allow to come into culture? <laughs> or can we imagine a culture where nature is an intrinsic part, like this Pahama, this, this 
South American Indian principle, you know, as completely alien and that will not in the culture. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, even for the ancient Greeks, or so, so this idea of the polis, okay, you know, uh, uh, the Parama is a different one, it's one step further. But the point is, can we even conceive in our Occidental reality, in our cultural sphere, can we even conceive that nature is not just an ornament, an ecological need, mm -hmm. but an intrinsic part of our culture? Mm -hmm. This refers to tomorrow, please, Tim. No? Yeah. It's a different um, approach. No? Yeah, and thank you. Metaphor Sorry. garden is more. Please, please, please. No, no, please, please. Thank you, Ayn, for your uh, impulse. It was very interesting. And um, I think the point is, in a way, that, uh, I mean, on Earth there are six million species. We are not the only one. This is, uh, this is the fact. It's plants, animals, and us. And sometimes, I think the point is that we think too much about ourselves. And imagine six million other species. So there's a lot of things to, to think about. And the point is that we are part of this diversity and um, I think uh, to how maybe the elephant in New York, maybe, of course, it's pushing it, but in a way it's, it's showing um, that we should think about also the others, not only ourselves. And this is we can maybe, yeah, live, in, live together with so many other species. And I think it's very important uh, thought because in the, in the past we made the the mistake that we thought that we are the only ones on Earth, and this is the whole uh, point of climate crisis, that we are we were living over our, um, uh, how do you say, uh, capacity, yeah, that's it, and uh, that's why we, if you think again in wildlife uh, thoughts, then I think this is a good path to go. Yes, I... No, please, 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 yes, you are. No, I, yeah, I completely agree. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I come from a, an ecological survey background, so quite often we would visit uh, a development site that was proposed for a housing development or a school or a, or a factory. And my job, the team I would work with, would be to record as many species, of course it's not comprehensive, particularly protected species, uh, uh, to get an understanding of the biodiversity of the site. And increasingly, it occurred to all of us that really there was always one species missing from that list, and it was us. And we would spend a great deal of time trying our best to design a site that would avoid impacts on protected species in particular, which are protected in policy and in law, but would have, there would be nothing in the planning system that would actually advocate for the humans that would be moving into this space. And so increasingly, we get very frustrated, which is why we came up with the nine-point system that we use today, that we would be doing our best to protect wildlife from development, pushing it away, in actual fact, leaving this terrible, sterile domain that, one, wasn't designed to keep people happy, it was designed to make money, and two, had already pushed all the wildlife out of the way, so there was not even any meaningful encounter with nature. So I think... You're absolutely right, but a better understanding of our place within the ecosystem, but we are another one on that. There's only one of us now. It wasn't that long ago there were at least three species living concurrently on the planet, but there's just one now of us, that is. Um, but we share it with so many, and not just around us, but on us and in us, of course, and that's in a whole other discussion. Um, so I totally agree, and I think we need to be, I think, more humble about our place, uh, and also right. more enthusiastic about the way that we share it, because increasingly, if we share those spaces imaginatively, we improve our own well-being, we improve our, out, our own out, we create new opportunities for the future. We chart a better future by doing that, so I totally agree with you. It would be a richer world in the end, and I deliberately wanted to come back also on this, in a positive sense, on this mythological, this, this, this ideal point. Can we imagine another concept of culture? Yeah? Nature is an intrinsic part of culture, much more than we can conceive it now. Imagine fictive. No? Imagine a real, fantastic architecture, ideal city. No? Uh, really, like a really, really good architecture. As an artifact, cultura at its best. No? And then it's integrated with nature. 
it would be a perfect environment and it would be the perfect fit. Nature is in culture and they, and they both come together. This metaphor of the garden what Massimo had in the morning would be fully realized on a new scale and in a new context. I mean, sorry, in a way, I think um, our culture is nature, or nature is our culture, let's say, you know, everything depends on nature. We breathe, and we get water, and we get food, it's all from nature, and everything from that, and this is the most important uh, for later uh, culture. So I think we should not have two words, I think nature is culture. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the nature of nature is uh, the wild. Is the uh, as a uh, theme. Exactly. So, so in in terms of designing nature, is I think is the, is the opposite. If you cannot design nature, you can design an environment, and, and nature evolves into that, mm -hmm. and and uh, is, is free. I think this is the, the, the question: How can we how can we uh, uh, integrate culture and nature? We just have to uh, accept that. Nature is uh, free and wild. Yeah, I, I think you're right, but I, I also think there are there is very deep set uh, cultural coding in the way that we live our lives and the way that we look out on the world that um, encourages us to see places as untidy, uh, as needing to be neatened up. Uh, the presence of moss on a wall as being somehow catastrophically damaging to to the building and to and somehow a sign of failure you know you must write a letter to the newspaper because i saw some moss and we've kind of ended up in this ridiculous place and so i think one of the one of the things we have to do if we think about human culture as the imprint of human personality and endeavor on the planet is it is it is malleable it is not fixed we can begin to develop a new conversation that actually welcomes this new compromise, this new accommodation between what we might call the, the non-human natural world and the human natural world. And so there is work to be done. I, I, I think we can't just hands off. We have to intervene. But in particular, the way that we talk and discuss, and of course this is a wonderful example, of a different approach to our, our own cultural makeup, our own cultural understanding, and actually our own cultural ambition. I think we tend to think of culture as set and the heritage as set and and increasingly the future has disappeared. This idea of, of lost futures, uh, I think, is a very interesting one. Where everything is nostalgic. Everything is just talking about how, how much better things were. And we've lost a sense of the idea, the amazingly dynamic and imaginative potential we have to create new cultural coding or to break old cultural. Be iconoclastic culturally iconic and I think that would open up fascinating opportunities for accommodation of humans and the non-human world in a shared habitat <laughs> yeah. 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 I would uh, say that most of the landscape that we have is managed somehow and uh, Farmers are a big part of that because they have a huge part of these areas of the, uh, their uh, control, let's say, or uh, are working with it. <clears throat> I would disagree that they do the wrong thing all the time uh, because they have to work with nature and for how that works. And it's sometimes uh, astonishingly uh, different from what, what you might think if you if you have the urban uh, view, let's say. So there's a lot of stories nowadays going on that things have to change in, in, in uh, uh, that area. And if you look closely, it's uh, a precise management of what they do. Mm -hmm. um, you always have these uh, conflicts of interests and you have to decide what, what to do. So if you want to produce food, you will have to reduce the uh, biodiversity a little bit in, in, in some area, but you can also. So they are they are also scaling, uh, uh, keeping the landscape as we as we know them, know it. Nobody um, uh, else would do it. So it would not, would not be the people from the cities going there 
cleaning up things and whatever, taking care. It's not always the case that fertilizers are spread indiscriminately to show us up in your drinking water. And that's what they do. In fact, the industry is pushing that. So I think we all can welcome the, uh, uh, you know, the new movement of organic uh, tending the land and, uh, and the land. It's more expensive, but they have to pay for it. You know? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely accept that you cannot and should not condemn the farming world as being as being universally hostile. Absolutely accept. But industrial agriculture has destroyed the ecology of the planet. I mean, it's just in our... Uh, I disagree there, definitely. Well, it's, I, I was going to it, so uh, it's, it's definitely... It's a story that's... It's two sides, at least. But, uh, yeah, especially... Usually, with a farmer, you talk with an expert in, in biodiversity. They know about the antagonists. And no, I, I, it, honestly, I, so I've worked with farmers in seven counties, only in the UK, and uh, it's it's just not true. So, in, and I'm only talking my experience that that they are they always are the experts in the biodiversity of their land. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They are incredibly brilliant at growing food. And earning a living off the land, absolutely, absolutely, they are. However, the intervention of the natural world is universally, I would suggest, other than when it is funded to be positive, seen as a problem. So the presence of wildlife and a requirement to support wildlife in an agricultural landscape cannot be accommodated in an industrial agricultural environment unless it is separately funded. And of course it is. And there are amazing, amazing examples of farms that we have one called the net state here. Now it's very unusual and in fact it's exceptional and hard to get. But it has done just this. It's entirely changed its approach. But I think we just have to face up to the fact that someone said earlier, and it doesn't mean that, it, that we all need to eat. We need food. We have to find a we have to find a balance. But the impact just of fertilizers, simply of eutrophication, of the over nutrient impact on land and water is absolutely catastrophic in surface waters, in marine waters. And I don't just mean run off into water, I mean air blown fertilizer that is 100% over applied. Now, these are real impacts. We can't ignore them, they are real impacts. We have to find a solution. We have to work with the agricultural industry because they are the experts of what they do. I agree with you. But we have to find a better accommodation because it simply isn't working at the moment. Well, I also don't agree completely with your point of view because, first of all, I also know a lot of farmers. I'm an agronomist. I work with farmers with demonstration projects, and you have this type of farmers, you have that type of farmers. It doesn't matter if it's organic farmer or another one. You have in both categories, both types of farmers. Even if I agree that with respect to chemical inputs, of course, the uh, biological farmers are doing better in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, what he also tried to say is we must also consider, if you are looking at uh, biodiversity of nature, what would have happened if the farmers wouldn't have done their work as they did? And of course, in the recent years, it's like, it is not that many decades that we have the industrial farmings. Then it started to get into the wrong direction. But all the time before, they were creating biodiversity by, you, by, by putting and other plants into, into, the, into the area. Mm -hmm. you, 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 know, you, you see that all the areas, they are really... Uh, like in, in, in Italy, in South Tyrol, or in, in France, they are doing a lot of effort to keep the farmers or in the mountain areas because otherwise they would lose, uh, uh, lose a lot of biodiversity. Yes. And it is the question, can you live with it? Because then there will be just more trees or whatever. That is another question. Mm -hmm. But it's not true that farmers only put farms. And the thing is, it's going into the wrong direction. It is done by policy, but it's the same effect in the industry. 
if you call air pollution, if you call water pollution, look at industry. Why do they have not um, plants on their roofs? Why don't they have more plants around their area? They did not say. Yeah, I I'm not. I, 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 I understand what you're saying, absolutely. And I don't have the experience that you do. I can only talk about the, the sites that I know here in the UK. So, I, 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 and you're absolutely right. There are some amazing examples of what we might regenerative agriculture. Wonderful, wonderful example. But ab absolutely right. For species that are adapted to an agricultural landscape, and there are many, absolutely, there are many. Here in the UK, top of that list, for example, the thing called the corn bunting absolutely relies on a prairie style agricultural landscape. Absolutely, totally agree. And can be accommodated by a sympathetic approach. But I th it's just that that is still unusual, is all I'm saying. I don't, I'm not trying to demonize the entire industry, but the industrialization of agriculture and of landscapes. So these are now industrial landscapes. They may grow food, they may grow fuel, but they are industrial landscapes. We just need, I think, to include a re-evaluation of these areas and perhaps be slightly less worried about the history of agricultural management in the landscape. And we need to look ahead. The landscapes are going to change. Climate change is going to drive an enormous yes. change. And so we need to work together to plan that future. Sorry. No, in a positive sense, a general point in a positive sense. Yeah. Uh, what we are discussing about, in my eyes at least, we are discussing about uh, how much nature can we afford, uh, and this also relates to farming, as so the very base of our, of our existence, we need to, uh, and uh, how to nourish, for instance in Germany, 82 million people uh, with non-industrialized agriculture, how to manage this. Uh, it could be possible, I've seen cases in India, so where they have this mm. traditional farming system, but there are many, 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 many farmers. Uh, uh, and this is not Western Europe, this is not the Western world, uh, so where it's concentrated on a very, yeah, quite limited number of, of farmers due to economic reasons. Uh, but how to overcome these problems? Uh, also this one aspect, one aspect is a paradigm shift, a mental paradigm shift. Can we imagine that culture is really also a nature? This was one point. No? The other point is the pragmatics. No? How, also, as exemplified in this, in this 82 million question, no? how to nourish 82 million people if they do not all have to drink pea milk and be vegan. Uh, I refuse that, uh, for instance. Uh, I want to eat meat, at least from time to time. And I do not want to be forced by a new green and dictator government that I have to drink pea milk only and be and eat carrots. My God. Uh, uh, practical. Uh, how to make but it? you can reduce. Of course, of course I can reduce. And I'm reducing all the time. Man, I've eaten carrots since one week. It's incredible. <laughs> it's according to my status. No, but this, this is not the issue. This is not the issue. The issue is, do we need centralized, industrialized systems uh, due to one simple fact, the relation between mass and power? No? We have lots of people, this is a mass with power, no? and we need lots of energy and lots of food to nourish these masses. How to do it? Uh, it's, it's, yeah. um, yeah, of, of course, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, Boyd, I your name, I'm sorry if it wasn't correct to pronounce. Um, that was, um, you mentioned it already. Agriculture will change. It has to change for because of the negative effect on, on the environment, which is of course existing, and also because of the climate change and the um, still rising numbers of the uh, population. So um, I think if you look on what are the demands for agriculture and what are the problems at the moment, I don't think that you can already figure out or think of what is possible in future. There will be things coming up we don't can imagine now. Uh, 
not only by eat other cultures, uh, other culture crops, um, eating also insects. Why not? I think there will be, and also technology will will help a lot in order to uh, to to nutri to give uh, nutrition to the people. I'm not afraid at all. If we really want to do nutri nutri the people, we can do that. There shouldn't be hunger at all. If we really would go on well with each other, then there would be no need. But we have to do the, we need the intention to do My that. My argument was not intended to be a killer yeah. argument. All the day I try to deliberately be a bit more interesting. Ian, please. No, I, 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 think, I think you're right. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And I, as well as technical ag uh, agronomics and the the technical selection of new crops and new techniques, which I'm, it, is happening very quickly. Um, I think we need to think about different structures as well. So in the same way that we should think of perhaps housing as a public good that should be fully socialized in the way that it's provided, I think it's that radical to think of food as a, as a public good that we should, should be fully socialized in the way that it's produced. So rather than it becoming an industry, it is run as a public service. I know that's that's a big step, but I'm just saying I think there are there are organisational changes as well as technical changes that are going to be forced on us because of the pace of change. And also I think the depopulation of the rural spaces of agricultural and the intense uh, increase in population in urban centres, particularly coastal urban centres, has to be part of that discussion. Is what role do cities in this multifarious environment provide, do something to provide food or to contribute machinery of food production or food management, That's because right. that's where people are, are going to yeah. end up. But the, 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 the final population is, is, is tailing off, but cities still grow again, and that's a crucial thing we need to plan for. Okay, one comment, and yeah, then we I've can uh, close I have one uh, proposal for the for the discussion. And we are talking about uh, the natural city, and I think a huge opportunity is the city itself as a production for food for ourselves, because you yep. are talking about habitat. You know, if you if you're looking at bio biodiversity, you it's not enough to put a. Um, a living thing for a, a bird on your house if you don't have flowers where, where they can feed. So you always yeah. need to think in small circles. Mm -hmm. And I think in the future exactly. it's important for ourselves, for our own, own food, to have uh, the food production in the city as well. And I think uh, a native of you, uh, uh, the Dave Golson, I think he did studies that um, growing your own food is 10 times more productive than industrial on the industrial field. So I think this could be also a direction that we maybe get more, also got get more in touch with Earth ourselves. Because I think the problem yes. is that we are lacking nature, and we should put our hands again into the ground, feel the feel the soil, smell the soil, grow plants, and I think this could be a great big big opportunity also for the change yes. of, of landscape and city. Yes, I, I, I think it's a really interesting idea. I, I took the point I would make, that is, I think the, coming back to the agricultural industry, the incredible skills and sophistication that exist there, applied to city landscapes, is something I think we need to, we need to think about, test out, because they have tremendous skills, enormous expertise in how to grow and make food, and applying that to a different kind of environments, peri-urban spaces, city spaces, because as well as projects where we, we grow our own food, I think particularly here anyway in the UK, very often in city environments, just getting through the day unscathed is challenge enough for millions and millions of people with accelerating uh, 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 child poverty, I mean with disintegrating infrastructures to be quite honest over here just at the moment. Um, those kind of projects are always going to be exceptional. Very useful, but exceptional. So I think we need to move agricultural expertise into city environments and see what happens, and allow that to develop, at the same time as encouraging partly for mental health and well-being and for social connections and for removing barriers of isolation, a community growing projects, absolutely. But it's too big a leap to go straight into it, expecting people to necessarily grow their own food, but encouraging opportunities to participate in learning what that's like. 
But I strongly feel that there is a wealth of expertise out in the rural environment that we have not applied to city environments adequately. And we should be doing this. Thank you. More comments? Oh, 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 well, uh, we can continue. I mean, Food is not arrived yet. No, you know, the agriculture <laughs> well, is, is just one, one comment to agriculture. <laughs> we produce an amount of, amount of food. One third of it goes to waste. One third of it. One, it goes to waste. And America is one of the culprits because of hygienic and so on, other kind of reasons. Yeah. You have to abandon. Yeah, yeah. It here is the deadline after that the stores done uh, it. Yeah. So, um, was, what we've seen in the, in the United States is some older factory buildings have been abandoned and they're doing stacked uh, stacked planters with lighting in order to grow vegetables inside the buildings. And it's it's a mix of industrial agriculture but also a kind of sustainable way where they're using a drip irrigation in order to do that and also having young people get involved in agriculture as well and they're doing uh, which you did not mention is like hydroponics in the buildings themselves so that there's fish that are being fed from the plants and then the droppings from the fish are being used then to irrigate the plants as well in this kind of symbiotic relationship in abandoned industrial buildings which I, I would like to think is part of the future. Yeah, I, absolutely. And wouldn't that be fascinating to construct these growing environments that, that incorporate effectively an encounter with wildlife at the same time because we've learned about natural control systems. But this idea of the combination of, of sustenance and mental well-being, but of landscape and mindscape, and something that George is very interested in, I think all of these can be concentrated more. So the idea of extensive systems concentrated into much more a much smaller interventions in, in, in a, using those skills in a city environment and then replicating or replicating or replicating I think is a fascinating area to explore. Of course you can't take group out of rural landscapes to hit. Not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that combination of skills from the agricultural industry and the and the concentration of human life in the city could work more interestingly together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here again, I think that sometimes the policies are more, uh, 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 how do you say, humanist, um, uh, uh, delaying the, the progress because of whatever rules, and um, and of course the lobbyists also <laughs> do their harm. In yes. Germany, yeah. at least, they are very strong, and uh, yeah, I think if there would be less, uh, we would make a lot of progress in all kind of types of of producing food is interesting and also what you said uh, in former times i don't know if it's this tuna, tuna circle that was the idea that things that you need daily or which need is an intensive needs an intensive care must be close to the farm and in the way or to the close to the city and then you the circle becomes <coughs> bigger and bigger <coughs> with uh, respect to what is not so often needed <coughs> which is less intensive etc and, and re producing food regionally also uh, um, saves a lot of CO2, energy, uh, time, and also animals. loss of yeah. animals and uh, other uh, problems, uh, phytosanitary yeah. problems. So, but here we have again the problem uh, of the systemic resilience we addressed quite often in the course of today. <coughs> the economic, the existing economic <coughs> system. Uh, if it's cheaper mm. to transport apples from New Zealand to Germany than to plant apples in Germany for Germany, it's incredible. That's right. This is a, it, it's an ecosystem of its own, this kind of economy. And this is the point of systemic resilience, how to overcome this, and the positive point, how to overcome this. In what, what I really liked in, in Ian's presentation, uh, to overcome the systemic resilience, even if we have a small house, huh, huh, we can uh, allow for a biotope to generate after some time, of course meaningful. Huh? We have no elephants in the street, except as I would be interested in a, in a Greek-speaking elephant, for instance, <laughs> ancient Greek, it would be really interesting. That's but right. it's not possible, no, but <laughs> we can allow, and we can do it by ourselves. So it's our decision if we let animals 
come into the house, <coughs> and let more plants coming and so on. This is makeable. Also, this is not only it's not only about systemic resilience. It, and there might be simple solutions like uh, put away the fences mm -hmm. in the city yeah. to to allow animals to pass through. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. it's really big hurdles that yeah. we have everywhere yeah. uh, to to fence off people yeah. or whatever yeah. people are afraid of. I don't know. Um, this is the and point. Then also, yeah. fences off uh, biodiversity. Yeah. I mean. I think that the point Small is a cultural large, point. It's a cul please, please. I think the, the point that you brought up about getting apples to Germany from New Zealand is a lot like the Amazon warehouse image that I showed. Exit. It's because we're so used yeah. to having yeah. things yeah. instantaneously yeah. Yeah. that yeah. people, there's so much has been written now about we have lost the seasonal sense of what yeah. food to eat at certain times, that winter vegetables, etc., because we're so used to being able to have anything we want at any time. Mm -hmm. But there's no turning back now. That Pandora's box has been opened. That, that yeah, this is the changed. point. Exactly. This is the point from the from the start this morning. Our yeah. original yeah. paradise. It's over, people. You know? yeah. We have to search for a new one. No? Even yeah. if we have to construct it by our own. And all these approaches, in a positive <coughs> sense, of the myth of paradise, are to construct a new paradise. No? No? how to improve, to significantly improve, and how to avoid the risk of doom. Uh, it's not nature that will die, we as species will die. That's a different issue. Nature will survive even without homo sapiens. This is, uh, I'm biologist, but this is no problem yeah. uh, for nature. Yeah. Uh, OK, may I make a stop? Yeah, please, please. And you said um, um, it's more important to put the fences down in the cities, for example. But I think one problem is, um, and I'm, at this point I'm a little bit skeptical, because, for example, cows, cows food has a big problem with wildlife animals in the city and in the suburbs. And if you put all the fences down, the boars will overrun the city, and maybe, um, uh, um, are uh, too dangerous for families. Shoot them, shoot them. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we are the, yeah, yeah, we are the top, we are the top yeah. predator meanwhile. Yeah. Huh? And, uh, mm -hmm. and we can control in a positive sense of yeah, shooting. Okay, but do you want hunters to patrol the city and hold us for? No, this is an interesting <laughs> job. Uh, th this is an interesting, yeah. let's say, life enrichment for interested citizens. No? Learn shooting. <laughs> huh? No, seriously. <laughs> of course, it has <laughs> it has problems, but but also seriously in this shooting example, no? we have to take the things in our own hand. We are not living in a consumer society yeah. alone. If we have wildlife in cities, uh, for instance, these wild boars, we have to control it now for some time, and then we need hunting. <coughs> also, we need we need to make things we did not want to make uh, because it's unethical or I don't know why. Yeah? But now the boar is in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was under. Now the boar is in the city, and you have to shoot it. Otherwise, uh, as the boars are intelligent and aggressive animals, as a potentially aggressive animals, no? you have to react, please. And we have to live then with the consequences a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the dead boar. You can eat it. <laughs> uh, farmers have to live with the wolves now, and and that's a problem for them yeah. sometimes. Um, though though the uh, dogs are a big bigger problem, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, nobody's yeah, yeah. talking about. <laughs> so it's a uh, hundred times. Uh, more damage done by dogs, and you don't get uh, funded by the insurance. <laughs> uh, but like putting that. fence down doesn't mean all fences. Maybe in some cases it might be uh, a good idea, <laughs> but there are many there are not. It's about the cultural paradigm. As a, I deliberately want to come back to the cultural paradigm. As can we imagine a culture with nature in a way that has never existed before in the occidental realm? Huh? So after the Greek policies, with the Sinoid, this might have been a difference. But if we take this ideal of the Sinoikia, that nature and culture lives together, and if we want to reinstall it today in our recent condition, uh, just to recapitulate, we are 
moved far away uh, into an intermediated reality. We are consuming narcissists, solitaire, so we are, and so on and so on. Uh, hey, uh, how to bring cult nature back into culture now? How to achieve it? And to, if we want to follow this positive ideal of the Greek, of the Greek polis in the Synoikia, and I deliberately try to make it so plakative, uh, so, so drastic. Uh. In any case, many thanks, Ian. Many thank you. Thank you. Okay.